Okay, let's discuss on simple RNA. To do the same MNIST classification, we can use an RNA. So the network structure will be different from this section. So we use simple RNA. This is a package from the Kera. So here we use the TensorFlow Keras, and you can get the simple RNA from here. And here, what we'll be doing is like you define the number of units here and the dropout percentage, and you give the input shape. And here, there's a specific parameter called return sequence true. So when this simple RNN is followed by another RNN, you just need to enable this as true because you need to create the link between uh, the first one and the last one. But here, if you take a look at this layer, this layer is followed by a dense layer. So it doesn't follow another RNN layer. So you just set this parameter as false. So this is something you need to do when you use this library. There's something to keep in mind. And here, uh, you have the number of labels as the dense layer because this is followed by a softmax. So this is classifying the numbers in the data set. So the rest of the code is same as you used with CNN, uh, MLP, and other layers. And finally, you get the training model, and you train it and get the evaluation here. So for this example, you can find the code here in the links below. You can have the Python script or the IPython notebook. In solving the same problem with LSTM, you just add the same three layers and here you mention the number of input shape and again you say this parameter as true so this is the programming aspect uh, of this uh, when we're using this api and this is again followed by a dense layer and again it followed by a softmax layer and finally you get the training model and you can get the training uh, down here and you get the accuracy here and the code for this, uh, this one is also available here. You can download it from the following links. Okay, let's discuss about the autoencoders. So basically, an autoencoder is a mechanism that is used to extract features from an existing dataset and interpreting a dataset. So here, what's going to happen is like you are going to train this model by showing different numbers and when you show a different number the network has the ability to identify the numbers accurately so here what you do is like you first uh, before creating the auto encoder there are two parts that you need to create the first one is the encoder the other one is the decoder and here uh, you add a set of layers and here what you create is a, like a one flat vector which has more features and it outputs uh, a small number of features, 16. So it started with 28 and followed by the output shape 28, 28, 32 in this layer, next one 64. And in this layer, you just create a flat uh, layer. It's th these are like a, a more like a tensor. So this is a flat one. And, and here you get these features extracted. So basically what happens is like from each layer some latent feature is identified so this is encoding so decoding you're trying to understand what is there so in decoding you go the other way so you start from this input size 16 here and you grow it back towards uh, getting the original image so here you identify certain features from the input data and you just uh, reconstruct the image uh, by looking at the input value so once you train with a lot of data you can get a better accurate so this is one example so after training you insert these values and uh, the decoder can also identify the numbers very accurately okay so now we are going to discuss more on convolution neural networks so convolution neural networks is basically uh, have this idea of uh, creating a filter or set of filters and going over an existing image uh, so let's say if we have a video so you have a video means a series of images so you get one image and you get uh, a filter 
because when you are doing a convolution you need to have a filter so in convolution you may have one or more filters so each of these filters will be responsible for extracting a specific feature from the image for instance one filter may be more focused on getting the edge data so let's say you need to identify a cat so you need to know the shape of a cat so you need to have more information on the edges rather than the colors but if you ask to classify uh, uh, different colors of cats so you need to pay more attention on the colors so different filters with different uh, uh, sizes of uh, filter size uh, they can grab different latent features from an existing image so this uh, idea is same for an audio or video signal Uh, we'll be discussing more analysis, uh, more things on the convolution neural networks like uh, uh, how you create a filter, how each filter is working on convolu uh, con doing convolution over an image, how these features are extracted. So this is just basic definition. Uh, what is convolution? So let's discuss dropout. So dropout is basically a regularization technique that is used to uh, reduce some of the issues when you create a model so most of the clear issues that you get when you are creating a model is that your model is overfitted the term overfitting means when you train a, a specific network with a specific set of data when you tra at the training step let's say you get accuracy of 98 percent so it knows this training data so well but when we input the testing data you suddenly see the accuracy is around like 40 or 50 percent so this means the training has been done so well so it 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 has been so much overfitted for the training data so it cannot understand another set of data to avoid this you basically use regularization techniques so dropout is one of these techniques used for reducing this effect uh, other than that there's another problem called gradient vanishing so to in order to reduce that effect as well so this dropout techniques has been used so we won't be discussing much uh, details on how uh, this uh, idea was uh, introduced by uh, deep neural network community but the idea of using a different regularization technique uh, in order to reduce overfitting and in order to uh, dilute the effect from gradient vanishing uh, you can understand how to use the dropout different dropout values uh, to get better uh, better training so here if you take a look at the AlexNet stats so they suggest a specific set of uh, dropout values which is uh, which was better for their uh, experiments so depending on your application the percentage of dropout can be different so this is basically experimental value so this won't this value won't work to your application but generally using a dropout value of 0.2 is recommended max pooling this is another important idea which is being brought with convolution neural networks the idea is like uh, when you do a convolution you need to extract certain set of features so to accumulate these features from an existing map you use this concept of max pooling so we'll be discussing this with a set of images so in the following section so we won't go into much uh, deeper definition here so it's basically accumulating a set of features from an existing uh, image uh, that, that's the place where the max pooling is coming so we'll be discussing in the future slide uh, how you can use this with convolution neural networks but if you can remember the in a previous slide we discussed how convolution neural network can be used to classify images in the MNIST example so in there uh, you create a, a max pooling layer followed by a convolution layer so the idea is to extract certain set of features uh, from a convolution layer the recurrent neural networks are a specific set of neural networks in previous neural ne networks that we discussed it does not use the previous state uh, it, which it uh, did some computation on but in recurrent neural networks it has these links with the previous state 
and it stores as a memory. So it uses a short term memory uh, to get some things done. So the short term memory, it specifically uses the LSTM, not RNN, but it uses the previous state as an input to the next state. So this is the basic thing with RNN. LSTM, it's a variation of RNN. So both these RNN and LSTMs are used for time series analysis. For instance, if you take a look at a speed signal, uh, there's a relationship between the word uh, that I specifically said before and, and there's a relationship between the words uh, that I speak next. So the word I spoke a few seconds back and words I speak a few seconds later, th they have a, some relationship. So when you need to extract some latent features like uh, predicting something like uh, what I'm going to say next after saying who is in the class. So obviously, so someone is thinking, so uh, someone will say the name or something like that. So this needs information from the previous state to do a computation. So specifically, this was used with uh, solving the problem of uh, gradient vanishing, which I explained previously on uh, the same way of using dropout in other networks. So this is another uh, neural network which is highly useful uh, time series data analysis. Uh, GR is uh, another uh, variation of weaker neural networks. So it doesn't have an output gate when it compared to LSTM. So that's the basic difference. So we won't be going into a, a deep analysis on GRUs. Uh, so GRU is just another LSTM. Uh, without an output gate. So that's basically uh, what GRU is. In some cases, it seems that the GRU produced the same output as the LSTM uh, because of the similarity in the network, but it only uh, has an output without a gate. So that's the basic difference. Uh, you can learn more on uh, what GRU is from the following reference we provided in the slides. So it's here. So we can take a look at uh, how GRUs can be used. So let's go to the next one. In this topic, we'll be studying the autoencoder. So this is the basic definition about the autoencoder. So basically, when you need to decode some information from existing information, you generally create an autoencoder. So this is an unsupervised way of learning things. So a neural network can learn a certain representation and provide a an output for us. For instance, reducing a noise. Uh, for instance, let's take this example. So you'll be having a conversation and there's a train going in the background. So what happens is when you rec once you record and when you play back, your voice is, it, it doesn't seem like it's very clear because of the noise created by the train. So obviously what you have to do is you have to remove that noise. So when you create an autoencoder, what you'll be doing is like you'll be having a set of uh, audios with uh, your voice which is queen voice and it doesn't have any noises and again you will have a set of noises like train noise bike noise uh, bird noise and other noises so what you'll be doing is like you'll be intentionally contaminating the data with existing noises and then you have an uh, uh, audio signal with mixed sounds from a train sound and your voice so and also you have the mapping of the original signal without the noise. So you'll be training the network. Okay, look at this one. And this is a noise input. And this is the expected output uh, uh, audio, which has no noise. So when you train this with a uh, lots of data, the network can understand and it tunes its weights and it create a weight vector, which can denoise uh, up to a certain extent. Uh, when you create uh, this kind of a network, it has the ability to uh, do uh, audio engineering to a great extent. And you can find uh, more information about the autoencoders from the link below. A variational autoencoder is another autoencoder which again do unsupervised kind of learning. So here the main difference is it, it uses this uh, mean vector and uh, standard division vector uh, in between this uh, encoder and decoder. So it does the same thing. So this is the main difference between the uh, autoencoder and variational autoencoder.
A transformer is another specific set of neural networks which is specially used for voice recognition and language translation. So here uh, there are some uh, research done by Google. So they have this different set of uh, neural networks. So here you can see uh, the transformer has done a better job uh, when we considering the English to German translation quality. So this is a certain metric uh, created in evaluating different set of networks. So this first one is a RNN based one, this one is a CNN based one, uh, SliceNet, another one with CNN based one, but you can clearly see the transformer is doing better. So this set of, uh, th this type of uh, uh, neural network is very good for voice recognition and language translation. Uh, most interesting and uh, very challenging problem solved by GANG. So generative adversarial network is more like an unsupervised uh, learning technique which is used to uh, generate certain new set of features. For instance, uh, I'll take this example. So think of like a person who is uh, expecting to do uh, counterfeiting. So you have original money circulating and you're trying to create a set of uh, fake money so here what happens is you train one model to generate fake values and you obviously know what was the origin value is so you have another model checking the accuracy between these two models so it's more like this generator model which creates new output uh, create new elements which it has not seen before and this discriminator element it take a look at the uh, things created by this generator network and says okay this is close enough but it's not good so it gives a feedback to the generator to improve itself to create better counterfeits so at the end of the training uh, the discriminator can't exactly say whether this is real or fake so generator has to be that good so once this training is done we use this generator to create new images so you might have seen this from different kind of applications you create uh, all the figure from a young figure so you train the network with existing data and you can transform an existing value into a different domain so a young person to old person old person to young person or maybe you can generate a new breed of cats by looking at different set of cats like uh, you see a limited set of different breeds of cats and you just create a new version of a cat by looking at the existing value so it's more like it's creating a new uh, set of features by looking at existing features so this is a very interesting uh, type of uh, deep neural network used by people for doing many tasks another important aspect of deep learning is the reinforcement learning so the idea is like you are going to train an agent to get a specific task done so this is not like a supervised task but the agent learns from existing uh, outputs so it's like it's going to do a task so let's say you are going to train a robot to go to a specific place but you don't tell the robot how to go there but let's say you have obstacles in the way so it's it's trying to find the way so you turn left and you find a brick so you can't go from there you find a wall so you, you just can't go from there so you try to turn in the other way so when you take a turn and it has a relationship between the previous state and the state after that so you just try to learn from existing input and existing output to get a better results so it's more like a reward mechanism so once you do a task the idea is you need to be close to the expected output so it means like in this example what you can see is like this uh, object is trying to find the cheese so it knows where it is but it's far away so what it always try to do is like it, it tries to go as close as it's possible so it keeps trying to uh, find a way out until it reaches the specific destination so there are deeper concepts regarding this uh, concept so in this class we won't be discussing theories in detail uh, the idea is to introduce what a reinforcement learning uh, mechanism can be so it's more like you train an agent 
to get the maximum reward out of a certain task. So these are the parts that we will be discussing in this series of lectures. So uh, we'll be discussing more concepts on deep neural networks in the next section.